Thanks, John. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Um, so I, I uh, actually, a return to Minnesota made me remember something that I used to do when I was uh, head of design and marketing for Aveda. You guys probably know Aveda's up in Minneapolis. And, and it's, um, it's an activity I'm going to ask you all to participate in. So I'd like you all to stand up for a second. I'm also using this as a mid-morning uh, kind of break. I want you all to turn to your right and face the person next to you, or you know, uh, the back of the person next to you. And I want you to put your hands on the shoulders of the person next to you. And I want you to rub gently. Let's not be inappropriate. Just a little rubbing. OK, now turn around and return the favor. OK, you can all sit down now. So what you've just done, what you've just done is you've participated as a group in an activity that made people feel better. Is that right? Do you feel better than you did two minutes ago? So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about um, uh, solutions to problems through patients' eyes. And uh, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit as we go further. But I want to give you a little description of what we do at J&J &J, uh, and, um, and what I do at J&J. &J. I'm an industrial designer by training. It seems like industrial designers are ruling the day today but with John's father and other, other folks. Although, and, and it was interesting to hear, hear Bill talk about problem solving. Because uh, you know, growing up as a young industrial designer, uh, in the generation before my, my colleague, who was uh, not such a nice uh, industrial designer, uh, I, um, you know, we, we, we had Victor Papanek who told us we should be solving the world's problems. And we, um, uh, you know, looked at things through the eyes of problems. And the evolution of that is, is pretty interesting. I manage a group of about 150 people who uh, uh, do design work for Johnson & Johnson. We were hired originally by the Consumer Products Group to basically do you know, uh, Johnson's baby shampoo bottles and the pu sort of public face of consumer products. Um, and those of you who have heard me speak before know that I usually talk about sustainability or uh, social responsibility. And the, the uh, logic that um, I, I would not be talking about that today was, was kind of overwhelming. So I have to spend one minute telling you as innovators to think about the problem of sustainability in the medical system. We make hundreds of millions of things that get used once and put in red hoppers and thrown away and buried in landfills because there is no uh, safe way to reuse or um, repurpose those things. I want to challenge the Mayo Innovation Center to think about that problem in the way that was de described earlier by Roger a in a new paradigm. And I don't know what the solution is, but I'll be willing to sit on whatever group will think about that problem. Because if we could figure out how to get rid of medical waste in a way that was more um, clear and concise and useful to the planet, we'd solve a big problem in the world. Anybody up for that? So I, I, I don't know who I need to talk to, but I'd love to talk to somebody at, at Mayo about doing that. So usually I'm talking about those things. I'm not going to talk about that at all today uh, past this. We have a small team of people in our group led by Lisa Nugent, who's the, the woman at the top, uh, your uh, left, uh, who is a, a designer as well, who, when I met her, was teaching at Art Center College in Pasadena. She was teaching a class in, um, basically, in design research and in digital uh, work. And uh, she had a project for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that was to help teenagers uh, who had life-threatening illnesses uh, help us understand what they were going through. It was a very cool project. 
And it made me want to bring her to Johnson & Johnson sort of without portfolio because I didn't really have a place uh, to put her. But um, we were doing all of this work on uh, meters for diabetes, by the way. I think that project we just saw is one of the coolest things ever. We make pumps called uh, Animus is, is one of our brands. And I'm, we're so going to talk because they're cool things to do. Anyway, I put Lisa to work uh, and with her team on developing much better ways of understanding how people with diabetes who have to test after every meal and four or five times a day, to do that in a way that was more um, sensitive and less complicated. One of the things we developed was a, um, an app for the iPhone that connects to one of our meters, not quite on the market yet, but it's uh, a project that I think is kind of cool. This particular one is a meter that's being used in China and in India in a community rather than having your own meter. You have a community meter in the neighborhood because there are less uh, developed um, systems and cost of the meters is, is high. Although this meter uh, uh, will retail for, for less than four bucks, which is a, is a pretty cool thing. So we, we worked on those. And what I want to talk to you about is how innovation and design adds to the value of science. And I want to talk about teams. Bill mentioned teams this morning a little bit. And I want to talk about how we take this idea of connecting people with diverse skills and diverse ways of thinking and putting them into a, um, into a logic. You know, since the beginning of medicine, the, the patient is always the issue and is at the center of things, but it's really more about the doctors trying to figure out what's going on. I, I was going to include in here uh, uh, Eakin's um, painting of the Gross Clinic, which has this kind of powerful doctor standing in the middle of the operating room, and the patient is basically a leg off to the right. And the idea that the patient is not center to what we do is, is I think, an issue for us as um, a, in, the medical, in the medical world. We have huge break, breakthroughs going on. There's a huge amount of innovation to be done if we um, do the science, but we also start thinking about how patients feel, what they're seeing, and how we can make that better as they are living their lives. You know, designers can go beyond the pill and the device and, and help develop these solutions. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through a, a project that we've been working on uh, at J&J &J, uh, to, uh, to do just that. Now, this is kind of a simple project. One of the reasons I'm showing it is that it's actually in the, in the public. You know, it's out already, so I can actually talk about it. One, you know, somebody earlier was talking about this idea of open innovation, and we, you know, I would love to be able to tell you some of the things we're working on because it would probably help somebody else do something, but the lawyers from J&J &J would come in and put a um, gag over my mouth, and we don't, we don't want that. Um, however, I'm going to talk to you about an interesting project that, uh, that somebody came to us. I, I made a speech about three years ago within J&J where I showed people what we were working on in our design team. And it uh, basically showed the idea of design thinking and applying innovative ideas to problems within the consumer products group. And um, this, this gentleman was uh, the head of uh, the medical device group and part of a group that is a, an internal joint, uh, ventures uh, group that uh, works in J&J. In &J. And he brought in this drawing. And uh, or these couple of drawings. And he said, we have this new device, and it's called a selective ner nerve stimulator. And it can be used for various things. The first thing we're going to try to use it for is overactive bladder. Uh, any of you know uh, OAB is a, is a problem that many people have as they, as they age, where they have difficulty uh, controlling their bladder. And that is not, if you can imagine day-to-day -day life without being able to do that, it's, a, it's, it's not a good thing. It's treatable by drugs. However, the drugs have side effects. 
and uh, uh, people wanted a simpler solution. And this, this particular idea provides a nerve stimulation to a particular place on the body uh, that allows the bladder to remain uh, calm in the, in the process. Now, you may be asking why there's a dime there. The dime is the size of the spot right here on the person that you have to accurately apply this patch. So this is a kind of bad drawing of, of the patch in place, but the idea is that if you don't get it within that dime-shaped space, it doesn't work. So the, the gentleman from the uh, uh, medical device group came to me and he said, we have this problem, you know, you, you guys work on consumer products, we wonder if you can't help us with the consumer here who's the patient. Because otherwise, we're going to have to send the patient to the doctor's office once a week to get the patch ch changed, because you have to change the patch once a week. And we think that's very intrusive in people's lives, not to mention expensive. And we said, you know, we said, yeah, that's, that makes sense. So we said, gee, we don't know anything about OAB. Can you help us? Let's meet some people and talk to them about what their condition is and how they are dealing with it. And so we talked to Jody among, she was one of about 30 people that we ended up doing very deep uh, probes and development with. And we developed this idea of the journey of Jody's life and how she had gone to the, um, to the doctor. The doctor said, you have this problem. And here I can give you medication. You can take it. She had a bad reaction to the medication. She wanted something different. Um, she happened to know somebody in the scientific community at J&J, &J, and they said, oh, no, we're working on this thing. Why don't you come in and talk to us? So we worked through Jody's kind of life and developed things about what she was feeling that helped us understand what we might do. We did the Synapse Project is what it was called. Actually, we called it the P-Patch. It's a horrible name. But that was the kind of shorthand. So I, I would go into meetings and say, so what's going on in the P-Patch Project? And uh, everybody would laugh, and then we'd go through that. But we did about a two-year project where we developed deep insights with those 30 people. We uh, began industrial design to develop a way of taking that patch that I showed you and getting it applied to somebody's backside within that dime-shaped spot that it had to go in. And um, through a, a lot of development, this is the device. Basically, we use the coccyx, the bottom of the, and, uh, have you ever gone on stage and pointed at your ass before? But that's what I'm doing. Uh, the coccyx. Um, and we use that as the, as the guide to develop this placement thing. So if you think about the thing you're seeing there, the arch is basically a handle. It allows you to place it in the right place. And then you use your other arm to fold down the patch. And it ro rolls into place and sticks to the back, back side and works. And if you read that, it says in four, week, uh, four weeks of clinical, clinical trials, there was no difference in patch placement accuracy or performance, whether it was applied by the doctor in the doctor's office or Jody did it at home uh, by herself. And what we were trying to do was get Jody to be comfortable with the idea that she could treat her illness and not have to go to the doctor every week. And even better, she didn't even have to have her husband do it. Because that would have been the other option to have somebody, you know, somebody's, um, uh, you know, significant other help with this process. But what we wanted to do was create a way where people became independent and they could deal with it on their own. It's launched in the UK. Uh, we've developed these tools that allow us to um, put uh, this in the hands of doctors to teach their patients how to do it. Uh, it's, it's going very well. It's very early stages, just, just went out, but it's a kind of cool thing. So I want to spend a couple minutes talking about some of the tools that we use in the process of doing this. This project was an early one. We are now doing it on uh, pain medication processes, uh, on an Alzheimer's um, drug that J&J uh, &J is developing, uh, on uh, some sleep uh, issue um, 
projects that, that we have going, as well as a, as a slew of others. And the idea is we are one part of the team. We're not inventing any of the uh, background here. The pill obviously comes from the molecule and the science and all of that. But what the marketers within the pharma group have told us is that they are looking for us to help with patients and caregivers and understand the lives that people are having and help them get through their condition in a better way. So traditional research uh, is, is all about market research. And somebody earlier was talking about the quantitative um, you know, uh, idea. And uh, Roger mentioned abductive uh, reasoning. You know, the, the column that says traditional is all about the old school, you know, you gotta prove it kind of way of thinking about things. The adapted column in the middle is this idea of using some of the old stuff and maybe connecting to new things. Innovative, and you know, I would not call these particularly radically innovative, because there are certainly other ways of thinking about it. Um, you know, if we interpret these, the traditional are more about counts and statistics and spreadsheets and being um, clear and verbal and tying it down and all of that. And the innovative ideas are being about content analysis, checking categories, looking for patterns and themes, developing affinities and clusters, and thinking about this in more visual verbal terms, which is what we as designers do best, and help our scientist partners get somewhere they're not today. That's, that's what we're doing. We spend a lot of time working on probes, developing things we hand to uh, people in our studies that they take home, and we try to get from them their emotional experience. We try to create a voice for the patient in the research we're doing so that the patient talks to us about what they're feeling, and we externalize these internal conversations that people with an illness have. Oh my God, this is going on, I can't, I, you know. So getting that onto a piece of paper in a way that allows us to uh, help develop uh, thinking that makes this better is, is what we do. So we get those kits back, we do a tremendous amount of synthesis and connection. Um, Bill mentioned earlier PowerPoints and, and Post-its. We're really guilty of PowerPoints and Post-its, but I think it's the way to kind of uh, assess the information and put it in a form that we can actually uh, read it. We then do in-home interviews where we get a sense of how people in their comfort environment are feeling about their, their condition. And we do uh, photo tours of patients' homes so that we understand how things are, are working. I'll give you a brief aside here. We, um, we did a project on contact lenses where we discovered that uh, something like eight out of 10 people put their contact lens fluid and equipment on the back of their toilet or on their kitchen sink. And the whole idea that contact lenses, which are going into people's eyes, are being dealt with in the bathroom in the first place, but are on the back of the toilet just sort of frightened us. And we started working on ways of solving that to get it out of that room and into another place. And I, I can't, I don't have time to show that today, but that's what we learned from going into people's homes. So we also are doing lots of co-creation with the groups because we want their ideas about how it should work. And we are also all about um, gathering information in a way that makes people comfortable giving it to us, telling us their journey, mapping patient experience, uh, writing a letter to someone else who has the same condition, and then recording aspects of their lives to, um, to uh, tell us about what the pain points are, but also what nourishes you and what makes you feel better, because from those, we get really good solutions. So our areas of focus are using human insights and prototyping hypotheses to do innovative research, to develop design principles and service blueprint maps, so we're figuring out how to make things happen. M building tools to increase self-awareness and adherence, because adherence is the big issue. If we can get people to stay on their drugs, stay on their devices, do the things they need to be do doing, they will be better. And we're doing that with a lot of data visualization platforms, therapy support, health risk assessments. And last, 
medical devices that communicate wellness. What we want to do is communicate wellness, that you're feeling better based on whatever the device is. And um, we spend a lot of time uh, uh, in being as intuitive about that as we can. So I'll leave you with the notion of um, the uh, very important idea of seeing the patient and the problem through the patient's eyes. Thank you very much. Take it for just a second, Chris. Um, <clears throat> when you were going around in people's houses and figuring out what was on their sinks and on the back of their toilets, <laughs> Um, did you happen to notice where I put my car keys? Did you, you didn't, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I think they're behind the toilet. They're behind the toilet, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, we want to talk about this just very briefly, this issue of compliance before we send you off to meet the speakers and then to the breakout groups and then lunch. Um, you know, uh, the issue of compliance is, is it, it seems to me, is a, is a huge, huge issue. From the perspective of medical practitioners and doctors and, and engineers at J&J, &J, do you think the number of tools available to uh, doctors and, you know, pharmacological designers is extraordinarily broadened if you can mobilize patients to be more involved, not only in compliance, but in actually applying devices, uh, uh, you know, different sorts of rhythms of, of actually taking medication. Suddenly, the, 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 the kinds of options the that are open. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the well, issues go away. Yeah, the issues go away. I think mean, you, if, can, you if, can create other kinds of things besides right. pills and devices. Right. I think that is the point. I think if, if we can get to thinking about compliance in a different way, it'll allow us to uh, take a leap, to get to another place. And once we uh, solve one set of problems, the next set will show themselves and we'll figure out what to, what to do there. But I think there's a, compliance is a huge issue in every business. From, from taking pills but also, and using devices, but also things as simple as uh, sunscreen. You know, the reality of the world is today that we should all be wearing sunscreen all the time. How many of you have sunscreen on? Yeah, the women do because it's in their moisturizers. The men aren't, the men haven't worn it for years. But we, you know, that's a compliance issue. We know that cancer uh, of the skin is going to get worse because we're not um, uh, being compliant about it. So doing more is a good thing. But, but it's also, if you can develop all of these kinds of compliance design issues into products it's a huge business driver correct right i mean and we you know we're, we 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 always ask the question right what, what's it going to mean in terms of business and this both improves health and enlarges the range of products that are available even to a company like j and j it's exactly chris right. thanks so much Pleasure. all right uh folks <clears throat>